Welcome to Real Physics. Maybe you know my series about great physicists and I'm calling this series Overhyped Physicists because I think it's important to know the difference. I think these people are overhyped because they're just not playing in the same league as the fathers, the founding fathers of modern physics at the beginning of the 20th century do. And these modern physicists are, well, they're as well brilliant, but they are doing another type of science. There is a tremendous shift between the natural philosophy oriented research at the beginning of the 20th century and the post-war high-tech sports and mathematical brilliancy. And well, Stephen Hawking is one of the main representatives. He's also a brilliant theoretician and uh, let's be honest, he's famous also for his illness, a uh, serious motor neuron disease. And uh, rightly so, because we, what he did is impressive. And uh, what really struck me when I first read his book was one passage in which he said, I thought about black holes while I went to bed. My physical disability makes this everyday activity a rather lengthy process, so I had a lot of time to think. Say with that. I mean, I think, uh, well, Stephen Hawking as a human being can teach something to everyone here, how to deal with uh, such a serious disability. And uh, rightly after in his book, he talks about his, uh, what is considered his most important discovery, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And Hawking argued that uh, the surrounding of a black hole, the event horizon, cannot decrease and that reminded him from a quantity known in thermodynamics as entropy. Or entropy always increases. So uh, this was a uh, very interesting theoretical insight and we are talking about black hole physics here and what is also very famous is the so-called Hawking radiation what Hawking was trying to do is combining general relativity with a simple quantum mechanical effect of uh, pair production and vacuum fluctuations. And he argued that even in the presence of a black hole, even in the vicinity of a black hole, um, where literally nothing should escape the event horizon, it's possible that a virtual uh, particle-antiparticle pair is created and one of these particles um, is uh, sucked into the black hole where the other one manages to escape. So at the very end this would be a radiation that if you do all the calculations would eventually lead even to the evaporation of the black hole. And that was a quite uh, sensational result, uh, a theoretical result. But uh, the caveat is here, I mean, unfortunately, if you do the calculations for a usual black hole, the time it would require to evaporate would be something like 10 to the 66 years. So that means we are in the totally unobservable regime, both uh, with respect to the entropy and uh, with respect to the Hawking radiation. There is no way to ever observe these interesting results. And, um, well, here we are. The problem is that modern physics uh, deals a lot with theories which are not really observable and testable. And also black holes are <laughs> fall into this category. You might say, no, well, there was a Nobel Prize for uh, black holes in 2020, right? Roger Penrose um, got the Nobel Prize for the discovery that a black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. 
Roger Penrose proved that black holes really can form and describe them in detail at their heart. Black holes hide a singularity in which all the known laws of nature cease. So one question would be if the fact that all known laws of nature cease is a law of nature in itself, but well, uh, I don't want to be pity, but in any case, um, the problem here is that you might prove a very good uh, theorem and th that might require really sophisticated and brilliant mathematics, but it does not tell you whether your assumptions were right. Okay? And uh, he deduced something from general relativity and its premises, but it's not that automatically reality is like that. And what's a little bit uh, strange at the Nobel Prize that the other half um, was going to observers and it seemed that as if so to speak the theoretical side was one side of the medal and the observers were the other side. It's not like th that. As I said, uh, Penrose's result is, is certainly very interesting and important and the observation is also very important but they're not as closely linked as it might seem. So what they did, the, the observers I'm talking, uh, was with incredible patience and a big radio telescope observing the center of the Milky Way and you see here 10 years over the range of 10 years they follow the path of a star orbiting about an invisible center and the really stunning result is that there should be a concentration of um, some 4.6 million solar masses and you see nothing, literally nothing. And of course the obvious idea is here that this is evidence for a black hole. So far so good. The problem is um, the, the size of a black hole is not really measured even by these very impressive observations. Uh, pictures like those are still animations and even the heralded picture of the black hole in the, in the elliptic galaxy M87, it's not really a picture. There's a lot of data processing which is not transparent in every respect and there is a lot of theoretical assumptions going into this picture. So the point I want to make is this. Uh, if you have science you need to test not only to test a concept or something but you need numbers you need quantifiable tests and general relativity is excellently verified there is uh, precise evidence for its validity we have observations of the perihelion advance of the planet mercury which amounts to 43 arc seconds per century the shift of the ellipse and the other picture is Sir Arthur Eddington's famous photograph in 1919 the deflection of a light ray by the gravitational field of the Sun but uh, all these black hole observations are not like this okay because what you would need to verify is the size of the Schwarzschild radius and here we are um, General relativity predicts that the, the, uh, there is an event horizon of the black hole and uh, the Schwarzschild radius from which nothing can escape anymore is two times gravitational constant times mass divided by speed of light squared. But if you look at this, it's weird because the idea is that a black hole is a very concentrated mass. Okay. So you imagine it must be incredible dense, there must be an extraordinary state of matter um, reflecting this density. And if you do the calculations for, for the Earth or the Sun, it's just like that. I mean, imagine, imagine the Earth compressed to, a, to the size of a ping pong ball, or the Sun, which has a radius of 700,000 kilometers, compressed to uh, a uh, ball of three kilometers in radius. It's it's very very strange that would be an incredible state of matter but uh, 
the problem is that uh, the Schwarzschild radius formula would predict that the density decreases with the size of the black hole. Just imagine a swimming pool of the size of the solar system and it would be a black hole. No unusual density would be required. And now it becomes even more strange. If you take a very, very low density of the universe, which is just one atom per cubic meter, and you take the size of the universe, it turns out the universe is a black hole. I mean, how do we get there? Uh, and this is what makes me think that the I mean, we have the excellent test, there is no question about this, but uh, all this black hole physics and also the early universe, what we're doing he here are huge extrapolations. And I think the very structure of the formula of the Schwarzschild radius indicates that there is something wrong with these huge extrapolations. And uh, I think there are good hints that we might not understand completely. There might be uh, a relation between the gravitational constant and the speed of light and the mass and the radius of the universe. This is the bottom line here and I wrote another book about that. But that's not the uh, main issue here. Well, let's talk about uh, Stephen Hawking and the difference to these earlier generation of physicists. They were asking the deep questions, but they did it with a contact to reality, to experiments, to observations. In later years, Stephen Hawking, he touched the big questions, but in a very weird and superficial manner. Uh, he was at the Lucasian chair in Cam at Cambridge University, a position that Isaac Newton and Paul Dirac held but his scientific output, honestly, was not like that. In his inauguration lecture, he talked about uh, the title is the end in sight for theoretical physics, promised a lot of things and uh, talked about string theory, and, but the output is almost uh, embarrassing. I mean, um, string theory is completely detached from reality that they, they don't propose even an experiment they don't propose an observation and uh, there are even some freeloaders uh, I am at war with Stephen Hawking and I'm important and uh, we're doing physics and no you don't because physics is always linked to real observations and experiment not to fantasies in 11 or 26 dimensions and I like the ironic comment of David Lindley in his book The End of Physics there would be a single consistent account that could tell us what the beginning of the universe must have looked like and there would be nothing left for theoretical physicists to do if you wanted to progress in physics we must go back to the basics and uh, tackle the biggest problems. One big problem is the incompatibility of general relativity and quantum mechanics. It's also Hawking's merit to have um, pointed this out with this black hole paradox and uh, linking uh, the quantum mechanical effect to general relativity. But uh, he did not really solve the quantum gravity riddle. I don't think he really had a promising approach to it. Even though he published a lot of books. It's a tremendous amount of uh, popular science you see here. But the elephant in the room here is who wrote all those books. I mean, I wrote a couple of books, not as many, but I know what it means to write a book, to produce half a million characters and to go over and over five or ten times and honestly you just don't do this by clicking through the alphabet with your eye muscles. So the question remains who did write all these books and why? And if we look at Hawking's environment, also his family, uh, he got married two times. There are kind of strange stories about his 
nurse if you google her name there are a lot of uh, stories are popping up um, Hawking uh, during that period of his second marriage repeatedly uh, was injured uh, hospitalized because he allegedly fell off his wheelchair there were police investigations nobody was talking about anymore when it eventually came to the divorce in 2006 and uh, well we don't know what happened there but all this leaves a bad taste about the people around him and uh, well I think if you really interested in the physics that Hawking was interested in uh, go to old books Go to a book, uh, Schwerkraft und Weltall, by uh, Pascal Jordan, who was in Hamburg in the 1960s. And Stephen Hawking was there. And I recently also interviewed someone who personally uh, met Stephen Hawking in Hamburg. So uh, I think this is the approach we have to take. Go back to the unsolved problems, which are unsolved for a long time. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it. And if you're interested in fundamental questions, subscribe to this channel.